Um, uh, welcome everyone. So today uh, uh, we have our uh, great speaker, uh, uh, Wei Min Chun. Uh, he is now in uh, Meta AI, right? Used yeah. To be fair, fair. Used to be fair. I don't know what we call now. <laughs> yes. And uh, I actually know the Wei Min a uh, very long time, and he was uh, he got a PhD in MIT, and he has been working on the uh, unsupervised training. Uh, representation running uh, before it uh, became uh, very popular uh, like uh, now. But he's actually uh, working on such kind of problem as a pioneering uh, studies. And he also uh, invented a lot of uh, the current uh, state of the art uh, representation running technology in speech and audio. And uh, not only for the speech recognition, he also has been applying this problem to the uh, various uh, speech applications, uh, including the, the TTS uh, and so on. So today I'm very excited to ha have uh, Wei and uh, let's uh, welcome Wei Ning. All right. Um, thanks, Shinji, for the very kind introduction and also for inviting me here. Uh, it's my pleasure to join the prestigious line of speakers I've seen like on this colloquium. And so today, uh, as the title suggests, we're going to share our recent work on self-supervised learning for speech, including a method and also several applications. Okay, so uh, again, let me start from repeating what's ever not been introduced by, by Shinji. So yeah, I'm a research scientist. And before that, I also interned at FAIR. Uh, Google brand and also Merrill, where I was hosted by Shinji, <laughs> very fortunately. And then I got my master and uh, PhD from MIT working with Jim Glass. And before that, I got my bachelor from National Taiwan University working with uh, professor, professor Lin Shen Li and Shen Tian Lin. Okay, so uh, since I'm going to talk about self supervised learning for speech today, uh, let me start with a brief introduction to self supervised learning and specifically trying to compare how it differs from supervised learning. Okay, so let's first talk about inference. So for inference, the goal is to predict some underlying generating factors from the raw data. So take ASR for example. Uh, the raw data would be speech waveforms, and the underlying latent factors we want to predict is the text that generates this waveform. So, the figure on the left shows a typical diagram for inference, where we will have raw data as input, and we pass it through a feature extractor to get good representations for the task. For example, MFCC or like PLP Rasta for speech recognition. And then finally, we have a predictor that is uh, initialized randomly and takes feature as input to predict the target. Okay, so in a non-end-to-end -end supervised learning framework, we are going to learn from pairs of raw data and labels. So specifically, what it means by non-end-to-end -end is that we typically decide some features based on the domain knowledge or transfer from other supervised learning tasks. And then we're only going to train the predictor, which is randomly initialized. So this can be an HNN model, a neural network, uh, whatsoever. So this was a popular uh, training paradigm uh, before when the predictor was not very powerful, so we have to do feature engineering, and also when we do not have enough data for doing end-to-end -end training. So now, uh, more recently, like end-to-end -end supervised learning has become the mainstream approach, where we still learn from the same kind of like paired data, like row, lab, uh, row data and the paired labels. But now the feature extractor is going to be jointly learned. So we're going to take the raw data as input and output the target. So feature extractor along with the predictor is going to be learned jointly. So this paradigm usually achieves better performance when we have a powerful model like neural network and also enough data. That is very crucial. And also compute. Yeah. So uh, what is uh, self-supervised learning? So in this paradigm, we still want to learn a feature extractor, but we're going to use just the raw data, so which means we don't have a label. So how are we going to do that? So we're going to do that by defining a pre-text task that derives some pseudo-labels from the data itself and create a task to predict those labels. Then once we define that, we can train the feature extractor jointly with this like pseudo-label predictor to train the feature extractor 
And this step is also often called pre-training or representation learning, depends on the use case. And we want to do that to differentiate from the subsequent uh, supervised fine-tuning step. So to give more concrete samples on what the pre-tax task can be, and also what their corresponding like pseudo labels are. Uh, BERT, again, is probably the most famous, most well-known example, where the pre-tax task is mask prediction, where we randomly drop some words, and then we want the model to use the context to predict the missing words. So the like pseudo label would be the words that are masked from the input. And CPC is another popular choice where the task is to differentiate the target frame or like target like patch from a set of like distractors, right? So uh, to give an example, the context could be, for example, like the speech audio from the very beginning to the fifth second. And then target could be like the feature frame like that is one step ahead of the last frame of the context. So say the sixth frame. And the distractors can be any other frames from the sequence. So we want the context to encode some feature which can differentiate that. So we will believe that it can learn to model the content by doing some sort of like implicit language modeling here. And finally, for versional autoencoder, or maybe like autoencoder in general, so the pretext task here is just like the reconstruction if you put them in the self-supervised framework. And the pseudo label itself would be the raw data we want to reconstruct. Okay, so once we finish the aforementioned pre-training step, we're going to remove the pseudo label predictor because we are not going to use that to predict anything anymore, uh, most likely. And then we're going to add a randomly initialized predictor for the real target we want to predict. So again, this can be, say, just a linear layer with submax activation for the characters we want to predict if it's an ASR or over speaker uh, in the set if it's like speaker identification or replication. So we can roughly categorize the fine-tuning strategies into two different classes. The first one updates only the predictor in the fine-tuning stage. And the feature extractor is kept frozen. So this is very similar to the non-end-to-end supervised learning approach. So for this strategy, self-supervised learning often coincides with representation learning because we use that as is. Another more popular approach nowadays is to fine-tune the entire model, which is more expensive but can get you better performance this way. So uh, for this strategy, we often refer them to pre-training because we're just going to use that to initialize weights of part of the model, and we're still going to fine-tune everything end-to-end. -end. So this is closer to the like end-to-end -end supervised learning approach in terms of the fine-tuning. So now we have talked about how like self-supervised learning can be integrated into the inference pipeline right, for discriminative tasks. Now let's talk about how it can also help generative modeling tasks so for non end to end generation, again, we're going to predict the representation, some representation of the data, raw data from some attribute. So to give a more concrete example, let's think about text to speech synthesis. So the label we condition on at the bottom will be text. And uh, uh, some widely used features include filter bank, when we have say a neural vocoder to convert it back to the waveform. Or we can also extract, say, like the spectral envelope, the F0, and also like the periodicities. When we want to use them with, like, say, signal processing based vocoders like Word. Okay, so to generate the raw data, as I mentioned, we need a vocoder that converts the prediction from the generator back to waveform so we can play it and listen to that. So there are vocoders based on signal processing like techniques, like I just mentioned, work. And also there are learned ones nowadays which are more popular, like the hi-fi GAN or male GAN or a lot of like GAN or diffusion models. Okay, so in the supervised learning paradigm, we again use handcrafted features like the ones I mentioned. And we're going to train the generator on pair data to predict rotation given labels. So filter bank given text. And in the self-supervised learning framework, what we can do instead is to replace these handcrafted features with the learned features from self-supervised learning paradigm. So to summarize like this introduction part, so we are going to compare these two paradigms. We see both of them can actually be used for pre-training. And we can also use that for feature learning, just extract the orientation from layers, regardless of self-supervised learning or supervised one. But the main difference is that self-supervised learning uh, can use 
like raw data, it does not require label. We define the label ourselves. Well, like supervised learning would need some label data for it to predict the target. So as a result, like depending on the pretext task, uh, self-supervised learning may learn more general features, as shown in like some papers that can be used for not only ASR but also identification, speaker identification, emotion recognition, language identification, etc. And on the other hand, supervised learning tends to learn more task-specific feature, where like uh, which is correlated with the label it wants to predict. Okay. So here is the outline of the rest of the talk today. So in which we are going to cover all four components, basically. So first, I'm going to introduce a self-supervised learning framework called Hubert. And then apply that for inference task, which is ASR that we're going to cover today. And then we'll show uh, it can also be used for reconstructing the waveform, serving as a vocoder, taking the remutation as the input. And finally, some generative tasks, which take like input or no input at all to predict these limitations, and then we can synthesize speech out of that. Okay, so now the first part, which is uh, the self-supervised framework. So this framework uh, actually works for both unimodal speech, like the speech audio, and also multimodal speech, like audiovisual speech, where you have videos of the lip crop and also like the audio. But today, uh, given the limited amount of time, I'm going to just talk about the unimodal case. But the model case extension is very straightforward. Okay, so when we want to build a supervised, self-supervised framework, one of the most crucial questions we want to ask is what a proper task is that we can learn useful features from the data and which task we might want these features to benefit. So our answer to designing self-supervised learning framework for speech is that we want to create a task that requires understanding the, of the structure of speech. So to achieve that, we want the model to be able to do two things. So first, we argue that speech can like, high-levelly be represented as like, a sequence of events. So an event can be, for example, a period of silence, which should be inserted at the proper place, a realization of some phoneme, depending on the, like, the previous content, right? And also maybe some nonverbal cues if we are modeling, say, like conversational speech, where I will laugh, laugh at the proper place to be polite, and also maybe like do some back channeling to present that like I'm still listening to you, for example. Yeah. So uh, this is like something we want the model to do. So we want the model to be able to discover such events and also predict like these events exist when you see the audio signal. And the second part is regarding the structure specifically. So just like text sequences, we know like speech events are also highly correlated within a sequence. So you know what events should follow by what events. And if you see something is missing, then you can infer from the context. So being able to predict an event without seeing it based on the context uh, shows the such understanding of the speech or the language structure. So we're going to do it just like BERT, which is mass prediction, but with some tweaks to that. OK, so now let's get into the details of the model. OK, so to discover a set of speech events, we can use any like acoustic unit discovery algorithms. And here we just like choose the simplest one, which is running k-means clustering on very simple MFCC features. So once we have a k-means model, then we can annotate each speech frame with its cluster assignment. So for example, here we annotate the sequence with 2020, 17, 17, 17, blah, blah, blah. So this will create like friend level pseudo labels, which we can use. So the purpose of this step is to discover units that may be of low quality, but it has like non-trivial correlations with the underlying events we care about. So to quantify if this is really the case, we compute the mutual information of like such uh, discovered discrete units. Uh, with the force aligned phone annotations, because phone events is something which have like we have a lot of annotations on, and we can derive also friend level uh, annotations. So we compute the uh, mutual information and found they indeed capture non trivial mutual information, which is a good point to start. Okay, so next, once we have like the friend level pseudo labels, we're going to build a model that takes raw waveform as the input because we're dealing with speech. And uh, we are going to use some local modules like convolutional uh, layers to extract friend-level features. So the friend, 
frame rates between the input sequence and the frame rate between the like the label sequence are matched now. And in our pre pre uh, preliminary experience, we found that we can also replace these like uh, CN modules with filter bank. So they would also work just as fine, but with maybe slightly worse performance because now you don't get to learn the feature extractor from end. Okay, so then here comes up to a part where like everyone is fair fairly familiar with. So what we do is to do random masking by replacing the mask frames with a learnable embedding. So here you can see at the bottom, we mask the second, third, fourth, seventh, and ninth frames there. We replace that with a mask embedding. And note that here what we do for speech is we do span level masking. So if we want to relate that to text, it's like if we have character input, we want to mask multiple consecutive characters instead of like just one random characters. Because if we just mask one characters, then the task would be too easy. And similar thing applies to speech. If we mask just one frame, then you can most likely infer what the cluster ID is from the neighboring frame, which is too easy. So we mask about like 10 frames, which uh, counts for about 200 milliseconds of the context, roughly a length of the vowel, yeah, in average. So we then pass the corrupted uh, feature sequence into a transformer model. So the transformer model has this self-attention, so uh, we learn contextualized representations from it. And then uh, once we get the output from the transformer model, we then predict the labels of the mask frames. So in this case, it will be like 20, 17, 17, and 3, 3 for the 2, 3, 4, 7, 8 frame. Okay, so for those who are familiar with automatic speech recognition, this task is also very similar to like what we do for joint acoustic modeling and language modeling. So I actually mentioned that like before this slide, because the model actually refers to understand the content in the unmasked region. So which is what I say as like recognizing these acoustic events, which are labeled like unsupervisedly. And then given the scene content, given like it understands what's happening in the scene part, it has to infer what's missing. So this is like the language modeling, but in a mask version instead of the like forward causal language modeling. So we're going to show an ablation study later that uh, what we predict really matters. Uh, so here we predict only the mask frames. So we're going to show if we predict unmasked ones, then it's going to be terrible, especially when we use pseudo labels that are of very low quality, like K-means on MFCC. Yeah. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, the quality of the pseudo labels we got from clustering MFCC is not good. So how can we improve that? So one thing we can do here is to use some feature for clustering. We use the same clustering algorithm, but use better features. So uh, one thing we can do is to take the contextualized features learned from Hubert from the first iteration Hubert, which is trained on MCC target, use that features and run clustering again, then this would lead to significant improvement, both in terms of the cluster quality, when we have, say, the same number of clusters, like 100, and also leads to better downstream performance when we fine tune a model trained on higher quality um, self-supervised units. Okay, so this is the setup uh, we use for pre-training Hubert. So we pretend on either 960 hour or 60,000 hours of libre speech. So for iterating the experience, we use mostly like 960 hour. We just scale that up in the end once we stabilize the recipe. And we consider uh, models of three different sizes. So first, again, we iterate our experience on the base model uh, for the interest of compute. So we train this model for two iterations, first on MFCC clusters, then on the first iteration, Hubert feature clusters. So um, this model is trained on 960 hour sets. So once we have a good base model, we can just use that to extract the features for the bigger set, which is a 60K hour, and then to run clustering, and then to get the labels. So we don't redo the process for large and extra large model because it will take too much time. So we just like take the label from the second iteration Huber base, and then train the large model and the extra large model with the same label for just one more iteration just again to save compute, and they perform fairly well too. Okay, so let's now, as promised, look at the cluster quality when using different features, and also when using different amount of data for running this k-means part. So first we compare uh, two features. So the first, sorry, the font might be a bit small, so I'll read out the number here. So the first set of the rows are MFCC features, and the second set of rows are Hubert features. And so 
the first row are using 100 clusters, and the third row, again, is using 100 clusters. So we should compare those two. So with 100 clusters, the PNMI for normalized mutual information, which is upper bounded by 1 and lower bounded by 0, uh, is 0.25 for MFCC and 0.56 for Hubert. So the higher the better, which means like it correlates more with the like underlying phone uh, vocabulary. So we see it's a huge difference, like point, about 0.3 uh, mutual information, normalized mutual information differs. So the quality improves significantly when using better features, as shown here. So next, we want to show how much data is needed for training this like chemist model, like basically the clustering part. Uh, so we train on like one hour or 10 hour or 100 hour. And for each setup, we train for like 10 times to get the mean and the standard deviation. So the result here shows that uh, they're pretty much the same, which suggests that uh, the amount of data we use for running k-means is not that crucial. They will produce like quality of similar units because it's a fairly simple clustering algorithm. OK, so in the next part, I'm going to demonstrate like how useful Huber is for inference tasks and specifically automatic speech recognition. So uh, let's go through the protocol here. So to fine tune the model for speech recognition, we first remove the cluster prediction head, which is just a linear layer, and replace that with the randomly initialized linear layer with uh, 26 plus 1 outputs, which captures the English characters plus a blank symbol, because uh, we use CTC as an objective for fine tuning. So that's what we do, which is like fine tune the entire model, along with the new soft hat, softmax head. So the uh, entire model uh, is fine tuned with the CTC loss. So we consider a uh, different amount of data to simulate like different resource setup. So we go from the extremely low resource setup with just like 10 minutes of the label data, all the way up to the high resource setup with like nice 60 hours of libre speech. So now let's check the ASR results on the standard high resource setup, like nice 60 hour. So we consider conformer as a baseline, very strong baseline, which is the state of the art supervised model uh, with about 1 billion parameters. So the water rate is 3.9 here. And next, we have noisy students. It's basically the same conformer model, but it does like the self-training, which is like you train a supervised model. You use that to like label all these 60,000 hours of the data. You merge them back in, and you just train for another iteration. And that's it. So it also uses the same amount of like unlabeled data as what we use, like we will show later. So it improves by about like 0.5% uh, absolute water rate here. So it's effective uh, for using the unlabeled data. Uh, the third baseline we compare with is the Wave2Vec 2.0 large. So this is a very popular self-supervised learning model for speech, uses, uh, which uses contrastive learning and also quantized codebook uh, internally, not as a target. So the water rate of that is about like 0.1% lower than the, like the self-training from conformer. OK, so finally, we show the Huber result. So with the same like size large model, Huber achieves the same performance as Wave2Vec 2.0. Um, in this like high resource setup, but we want to argue that like Huber is also conceptually easier to to tune because we just like do clustering and prediction as opposed to for contrastive you have to be careful about how you select the negative samples compared to the positive samples. And for the extra large model, which we further scale up by the size of the model, we get like the new state of the art on the like self supervised benchmark, which is a two point nine on the deaf other the more noisy set on the libre speech test set. OK, so we've seen the high resource setup. So let's compare uh, Wave2Vec and Hubert more closely in terms of the data efficiency, namely how much label data does it require to tune the model. So uh, we can see here Wave2Vec 2.0 has uh, 8.2 water rate with just 10 minutes of the data, which is already very, very impressive. Imagine just like less than to 10 hours of the label data and text, and you are able to give a water rate of about 8%. So it's very good. So we see here for Hubert Lodge, um, we see earlier that for the high resource setup, like they achieve the same performance. But actually on low resource setup, say like 10 minutes, 1 hour, 10 hour, or 100 hour, they perform like better than uh, Wave2Vec 2.0 uh, by a non-negligible margin. So I think like it's just like consistently better uh, on this. 
And finally, if we again like use the extra large model, then we see even better performance on all these models. So usually you would imagine like large model tends to overfit significantly, especially when you have like limited amount of data. But like this is no longer the case when you have enough data, unlabeled data for pre-training, and you just fine tune with a small amount of data, and you still benefit from the increasing modeling capacity of these models. Yeah. Okay, so now let's shift. Uh, yeah. The previous slide. Uh, when, for example, we don't use any self supervised running and just 10 minutes to train the model, yeah. how much can the model? <laughs> so, if we were directly train this model from scratch, then the answer is like it just doesn't train. Yeah, it's just like fail miserably, like 99% water rate. Yeah, but yeah, of yeah. course, like Wrong. because li this size is not suitable for such little data. Uh -huh. Of course, you can get non trivial number, maybe with one layer transformer or even not transformer, just a CNN. Uh -huh. But yeah, but with such deep model, I think it basically fell all the way up un until you get about like 100 hours. Yeah, uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah. that's like empirical experience. Uh -huh. experience. Okay, so now we're going to shift gears to study the importance of the pre-training task. So more like the application study section. So the proposed one predicts the cluster assignments for only the masked frames. So this is the, as I say, like two, three, four, seven, eight here. So alternatively, we can predict the rest of the frame, which is like the unmasked ones, like one, the first, the fifth, the sixth, and the ninth frame. Or finally, we can just like predict like every frames. Sorry, I messed up the number here. Like, but anyway, um, okay. So, in uh, in addition to showing the effective or importance of the pre-training task, here we also want to study uh, if the selection of the task is important, regardless of the quality or actually relevant to the quality. Okay, sorry. So here we consider clustering on three uh, different features. So on the left we have MFCC. The PNMI is 0.24, which is bad. The middle, we have clustering the first iteration Hubert feature with a PNMI of uh, 0.63. And finally, we have one uh, with clustering the second feature, second iteration feature, which is the label used for the large and the extra large model training. So it has the best uh, NMI here, which is uh, 0 0.70. So first, we see the yellow bar, which is a proposed task. So again, we see still, if we train on better quality, clusters, then the performance is better. So improving from 17.9 to 10.7, right? But here, if we use an alternative task, which is predicting unmasked frames, then we see like basically it doesn't work for MFCC. So you can imagine like this is just like, what it does is to see the feature itself, see the waveform, and predict the MFCC of that waveform, which you already see. So this is a very simple and trivial task, which does not learn anything for the model. So this is very bad. And on the other hand, if you have high quality label, then it's still useful for a feature to learn something to predict that. So we see about 13.8, which is about like 3% gap between mass prediction versus unmasked prediction. And finally, like uh, if we predict all the frame, then the performance is just like in between of these two. So which also makes sense because like some of them are useful, some of them are not useful. So we see here to conclude like the task we use for pre-training is very important, especially for low quality teachers. Okay, so uh, this concludes the first half of the talk. So in the second half, uh, we'll move on from inference tasks to generative tasks. So to start, we're going to study if these remutations learned from Huber, like the remutation or units, are good for reconstruction. So if they are good for reconstructing the waveform, then we can probably replace that for the generative modeling targets. So for example, for text-to-speech synthesis, we can predict units instead of waveform directly or field bank directly and similarly for speech-to-speech -speech translation. Okay, so as shown in the diagram again here, uh, one of the byproducts of Hubert is the high-quality discrete units learned by quantizing the feature. So at the bottom, we have the discrete units. So we want to see if these units in particular can serve as a better representation for generative, generative tasks. So to be more specific, we want to see if these units encode mostly just the contents which include both phonetic content and like nonverbal communications, but not so much about like speaker or prosody or noise, which we usually think correlate less with the condition labels we want to synthesize the speech from, like text. So if this is the case, then first we can use like these discrete units maybe as a codec for low bit ray transmission. 
and also, like I say, replace tags with these like discrete units. Okay, so uh, to study that, we're going to adapt from a model called HypeGen. So this HypeGen is uh, was originally designed as a vocoder, which converts, as you can see at the bottom, a spectrogram back to the waveform. So we're going to repurpose that. So what we do is to instead of like taking the spectrogram as the input, we're going to feed the model with like three streams of the input, which we think, which we believe capture the sufficient information we need for reconstructing the waveform. So these three streams are self-supervised units, which we want them to capture content, uh, F0 units, which we want them to capture the porosity, and finally the speaker embedding, which uh, capture the speaker variation. So for the content encoder, uh, we're going to compare three types of self-supervised learning units, including like Hubert and uh, VQVAE as a baseline, which just does reconstruction and also learn codebook jointly, and also CPC model, which trains on contrastive loss. For the prosody, uh, we're going to model the speaker normalized pitch uh, in order to represent the intonation, because like the relative pitch would be what's uh, like missing from the speaker one. And we can evaluate, we can infer the speaker's information like pitch, average pitch, or like pitch standard deviation from the speaker embedding itself. So, uh, and also like note here, we, what we do is to extract the normalized pitch and then train a VQVAE on this normalized pitch contour to produce like a discretized prosody representation. And the purpose of that is to get more compact representation for uh, building a code deck which is more efficient than continuous features. And this VQVA, again, is different from the previous one for content modeling. So the previous one takes the raw waveform, the entire waveform as the input. Well, this one just takes the F0 contour. Yeah. Okay, so we pretend that separately and then like just extract that on the fly when we train this high packet model. And finally, for speaker modeling, uh, we just like, yeah, go ahead. The pitch quantizing? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's just like a VQVAE model. So for a VQVAE model, you, have a, you take the F0 contour as the input, you encode that, and it also quantizes the codebook with like some gumbo softmax tricks or with a straight through estimator. So you can infer them to the code, uh, you can, and then you, it has a decoder to reconstruct them. So once you train the model, you just take the encoder and then take the pitch, so you can convert the pitch contour into a sequence of units. Yeah, at the fixed frame rate. That's what you pair with the self-supervised units and to feed them along uh, into the final uh, hypergame model. Yeah. Okay, so finally for the speaker encoder, we just again like take an off-the-shelf speaker verification model, uh, D-Vector specifically, which is trained on uh, Voxelab 2. So this is a global embedding, which means that we only need one such vector for, each for one utterance. We do not need to extract one speaker embedding per segment. So what we do is to extract that and then concatenate, repeat, repeat that with every frame for concatenation and feed into the uh, hypergame model. Yeah. Okay, so for the experiments, we train these models uh, on LJ speech and VCTK, which is which are pretty standard like data sets for text-to-speech synthesis. So we include two types of evaluation here. The first one is on reconstruction, which means we encode an utterance to get the three strings of the input and decode that as is without manipulating the internal reputation. So we measure how well uh, it captures the content with water rate, how well it, how well it captures the prosody with the uh, frame F, uh, F0 frame arrow or frame F0 arrow, which measure how much it deviates from the uh, expected like F0 or when you have a voice event, does it really produce an voice event, something like that. And finally, we measure the overall quality with mean opinion score, which is a subjective evaluation metric. And next, the second type of evaluation we do here is disentanglement, where we want to see if like the information are really being encoded in the corresponding like stream. So basically, we want to see speaker is only encoded by the speaker embedding, but not by the content embedding, and vice versa. Like, and also, prosody is only encoded in the prosody code, not the content code. So today, I'll just present the result on speaker, although we do have the F0 manipulation in the paper. 
Uh, but again, like to save some time, I'll just present this. Okay, so let's first look at the reconstruction results on LJ speech. So uh, first, uh, this is the prosody preservation. So we see VQBA has the lowest error, so it performs the best on reconstructing the original pitch contour. And for water rates, uh, the leftmost one is the water rate on the ground truth, which is uh, 5.6. This is a baseline. And then uh, for CPC, it performs uh, second best. And for VQVA, it performs the worst, which is 8.85 on the right. And Hubert, on the other hand, uh, preserves the content the best. So when you decode that, it only has like about 1.3 extra water rates compared to the baseline here. And finally, for mean opinion score, we see that uh, CPC is the worst, and VQVA and Hubert are roughly the same, like 3.66 here. So we see like VQVA and Hubert are good on different categories. And next, we want to study what about this entanglement for these three different codecs. Yeah? Uh, which ASM model was used for this? Was the what model? Uh, yeah, I think we just uh, take the wave to wave to vec model, wave to vec plus self training model without uh, language model decoding. So just use that as is, yeah. Okay, so next move on to the speaker disentanglement where we're going to do speaker conversion. So for that, what we do is to infer again like the three streams. So we have speaker embedding, content embedding, and process embedding. Then we're going to swap the speaker embedding with uh, another speaker embedding inferred from an utterance of a different speaker. So we can see if the, only the speaker content, if only the speaker change, but other factors does not change. Okay, so here the first one is some water rate. So we see, uh, again, like the CPC here is, uh, CPC and Huber are pretty good, like 15 and 12, Huber is the best. And VQVA is much worse, it's like 29 here. And again, on equal error rate, like VQVA also performs the worst. The equal error rate measures how similar the generated, spe uh, generated speech sounds like the original, the reference speaker you want to convert it to. So the lower the better. Here, uh, VQVA has about like 12%. And also for mean opinion score, the VQVA again is the worst, which is only like 3.0. So all this evidence shows that uh, VQVA fails at disentanglement. And Huber performs the best on encoding a content and preserving the quality, while slightly worse than like CPC on speaker, so maybe it disentangles slightly worse. So the conclusion is like Huber at least is more disentangled than VQVA and preserves more content as CPC. So that motivates us to use Huber units as a target for a lot of like downstream tasks as a target, like speech to speech translation. Okay, so for this kind of study, I think like nothing speaks louder than just like listening to the audio samples themselves, right? So I'm going to play some of them today. Uh, so let's first play the original utterance. Let me see if I can get it work. I've been in two finals and I've got a medal. Okay, can we hear that okay? All right, so let's first compare the reconstruction uh, from Hubert. I've been in two finals and I've got a medal. Okay, and then VQVA? I've been in two finals and I've got a medal. So at least they sound similar to me, and this is also reflected in the mean opinion score. So now let's see how they perform when they are converted to a male speaker. So this is Hubert. I've been in two finals and I've got a medal. So you see the proxy contour is about the same, the content also being preserved, and it's being converted to a male speaker. Right, so let's see the failed case for VQVAE. I've been in two finals and I've got a medal. So you can hear basically like the, uh, the voice when we use VQVA somehow like changes in, within an utterance. So this is because like this speaker information is being encoded in not only uh, in the speaker embedding, but also to some extent it's encoded in the uh, content embedding. So the model would get confused uh, where it should determine the speaker information from. So that's why like it switches voice in between. And this is also uh, very correlated with the quantitative study we just showed, which has higher equal error rate and also worse like mean opinion score. Okay, so uh, in the like last module, yeah, go ahead. Uh, 
Yeah. Right. So this is uh, VQ VAE one. So it does not have the hierarchical structure. So yeah, definitely if you use two, maybe uh, it can capture better or it can distinguish better. But it may also not because like the again like the objective for VQ VAE is still reconstruction, right? So what it does is still try to preserve whatever information useful for reconstructing the waveform. So if you do not supplement that with additional speaker embedding, then the speaker information has to be encoded somewhere in the codebook for better reconstruction, right? So that's like, I would still believe like the speaker would rather be entangled in the codec, yeah. Okay, so uh, the next part, I'm going to show uh, how we can use that for generative modeling. And so before doing that, let's just like do a quick review on what we have built so far. So first we have a supervised, self-supervised unit extractor that can encode mostly the content and does not require any supervision. And also we have built a vocoder with this entangled control where content can be controlled through these self-supervised units and plus the speaker through other streams. So our next goal is to replace the handcraft features such as filter bank with a least Units as a target. So uh, you might want to ask, like, why do we want to do that? So there are like two reasons, main reasons, like if I were to defend. So the first one is like um, uh, comparing uh, predicting filter bank versus like predicting these discrete units in task, like uh, say text to speech translation, for example. Then like you will see filter bank uh, contains not only the content information, which is correlates with the input of the model, like source language text, but also all the information that's uncorrelated and it has to model the vari uh, variation of, like the acoustic environments, the speaker variation, and also all the factors there, right? And on the other hand, like the units capture mostly what's being correlated between the input of the model and the output of the model. So this is like the speech to text translation versus speech to speech translation using filter bank. Yeah. And the second reason is that like these units uh, are discrete, they are just like text. So fortunately, uh, whatever found like useful on um, like text modeling, we can just like reuse that here for units modeling. So we can basically borrow a lot of like learnings from like text-based processing here. So this is like what we do. Uh, so the first task we're going to use for demonstration is speech to speech translation. And the task of that is we want the model to take speech in the source language, say the speech in English, and output speech in the target language, say Spanish. So traditionally, we have had these systems before, but these systems were typically like cascaded system. So for example, we can cascade an ASR with machine translation with TTS to build a model, finally have a vocoder. Or we can combine the first two because there have been a lot of recent work on speech to text translation. So to reduce one module there, but still cascade because it does require the internal text limitation. And then uh, what we want to do here is call like direct speech to speech translation, which still have vocoder, uh, like if one were to criticize, but like the key point here is that we do not require text as intermediate output for that. So this thing is like rather trend like end to end compared to like other more cascaded systems. And also there are three main reasons why we want to do like this framework on the right as opposed to the other two on the left. The first is that, so by removing text from the pipeline, uh, we can build a system that can also work for unwritten languages, right? Unwritten like in source language or unwritten in target language. For example, I speak like one of those languages, like Taiwanese. So this is something where actually a large population of people in the world still speaks. So we want to support that, of course. And second reason would be more practical because we want to remove the, reduce the number of components such that we don't have to have cascaded system which propagates the error, increasing the memory footprint and also increasing the runtime because maybe you have like three non-autoregressive decoding, which is expensive. Although I know there are also some recent work from say Shinji's group trying to you know, like alleviate that. So I won't say it's a definitely like negative, we cannot solve. But okay, so uh, let me now introduce our model for direct speech to speech translation, which is based on unit. So what we call is a speech to unit translation here. So our system is still a very standard like seek to seek model, which uh, uses transformer encoder and transformer decoder. And it has this model attention 
multi-head attention module to attend back to the encoder for better performance. And the uh, unusual part is like, um, sorry, we predict like units instead of filter bank, which I keep iterating. So uh, as for the unit reputation, here we do make some like modeling choice, uh, different from the previous ones. So we know that uh, Hubert, along with the K-means quantizer, can transcribe speech into a sequence of units with constant frame rate. So suppose we have a sequence of like six frames. Then what it is going to do is to transcribe into one unit per frame. So here we see like eight repeated by three times, 13 and one repeated by two times, right? So this kind of like number of repetition here uh, roughly refers to like the duration of the event, right? So you can think of like eight as some phonetic content, which has duration of three, right? So uh, what we want to do here is first we want to reduce the burden of this model because having to learn translation is already like a lot of work. So we want to make its life easier. So we wanted to not model the duration by uh, predicting the deduplicated version. So basically it means we do not predict the duration. So the way we do that is by doing loose, uh, lossy wrong length encoding, just like collapse consecutive frames into one single se segment. So this is more like segment level representations we are predicting. And if you think about like speech to text, it's also the same, right? Because we don't repeat the character a number of times of its duration. So this is what we do here. And then for the vocoder, we're just going to use the uh, high again I just uh, we just introduced. And because like in this attempt, we only care about the content. That is what we measure. And because we also use synthetic speech as target. So speaker and the prosody is not re related to the source speech. So we don't want to model that. We don't need. So uh, we train another high again model that does not have pitch input. And it's only trained on single speaker. So we do not have to condition on a speaker embedding. So this is one channel LG speech. So we do need a very lightweight duration predictor for the output of the S2UT model because it was predicting the deduplicated version. So we just add a very, very simple like a CN model to predict what the duration is and then repeat them by the predicted number of times and then feed into the vocoder to complete our entire pipeline here. And then uh, to further improve the performance, we follow the recipe from a paper called Translatotron from Google. So they introduce like two auxiliary tasks. So aside from predicting uh, the filter bank features, it also adds one encoder, uh, sorry, one decoder to take the encoder output as the input and decode the source speech characters. So you can think of this as an ASR auxiliary task. And similarly, if you have the text for the target speech, you can also do a speech to text uh, translation as an additional auxiliary task. So predicts like target characters. Okay, so uh, in addition to these two tasks uh, we, uh, we borrow from Translatron, we also propose another auxiliary task for the unit decoder. So what we do is for the unit decoder, it was originally predicting the unit outputs, right, uh, for the target language. So what we can do is to take some internal representations from the decoder and just add a simple softmax layer to predict the target sequence character with the CTC loss. So this is a auxiliary loss added on top of the decoder instead of on top of the encoder, where previous two are only updating the encoder directly. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to show some results here. So we run our experiments on uh, Fisher Spanish English dataset. So as I mentioned, the target speech is synthetic because the dataset only comes with text for the, target, uh, for the target language. So we just use a TDS model to synthesize the speech into speech and then to simulate like different scenarios where the source is written or not and whether the target is written or not. Okay, so we compare our proposed method with again Translatotron, which is a state of the art uh, end to end methods for speech to speech translation. And we also compare with like a uh, two cascaded model uh, which, as I showed earlier, cascade either three modules or two modules. So, as I show on the table on the right, so this compares like our model versus Translatotron. So you can see like they are fairly similar instead of like two places. One is we predict self-supervised units, and the other is we have an additional auxiliary loss for the decoder. Okay. 
So we see like the blue score for translator trauma. Okay, so blue score is the one that used commonly for translation. So what we do is actually take the speech output, run it through ASR model to get the text, and then do like blue score evaluation. So this way we can have more quantitative evaluation as opposed to asking human to listen to that to transcribe and compute, which is expensive. So anyway, yeah, for translator trauma, we have about like 25.6 blue score, which is okay-ish. And for cascade system, uh, we just use those components that are available on FairSeq. So it has about like 44 and 40 blue score, uh, which is very good. And this is probably the, about the best numbers uh, on like the synthetic data sets. And finally, for our approach, we actually get also about like 40 point blue score. And this is very close to the, uh, the second cascaded system, which combines S to T translation, followed by TTS, and a bit behind the three stage cascaded system. But like uh, our system only has one module as opposed to three sig to sig models or two sig to sig models compared to the two ahead. So it's definitely like faster and lower, smaller footprint. And also we see like the performance of that is like significantly better than the trans translator trauma. Okay, so in the next part, we're going to simulate all the setup. So previously we showed that we can use like this auxiliary task because we assume like the source and the target languages are written. So, and we also have text transcripts of them. But then what about like different cases? For example, when source is written, but target is not written. So this could be, for example, like uh, English to you know, Taiwanese translation, for example. Yeah. So uh, this is a setup we first consider. So in the table, again, we are going to remove the speech translation auxiliary task because target text is not available now. So now the difference between translator Chong and uh, S2U only differ in the target they predict. So let's see the result. So for translator Chong, you see the performance degrades significantly. So it drops from about like 25 to now just like 7.2, which probably just predicts some functional words and have like high frequency here. And for our model, we just like degrades from about 40 to 36, uh, 35.2. So it's still fairly decent. And moving on to simulate a more extreme case where both source and the target are not written. So you will only have like the speech as input and like a speech of the target language as the output. So what we do here is, uh, again, we show the comparison on the table below. So again, like we predict different targets. And here you see, because we don't have the uh, source text, so we cannot use the ASR as an auxiliary task for translating Totron, but we do have a model that can transcribe the source speech into like discrete units. So we actually add an auxiliary objective called S2U, which means we have a decoder predicting the source speech units and have another decoder predicting the target speech units. So this way, this is still very legitimate, like unwritten setup. So let's compare the results. Again, like translator trauma entirely breaks. So now it's only like 0 0.6. Uh, I think it's just like predicting an end of sentence, like maybe like every time. And then like we have this uh, UW speech, which is another baseline that shows the best performance on the unwritten setup um, in this data set. So what it does is to learn some, very, also very similarly, learn some discrete units, but it has the uh, phone, phone level supervision from other languages. So we can think of it as training a like IPA or something that can generalize to an unseen language and use that as a target. So they get okay-ish performance like 9.4. But now let's look at our model. So we get like 31.8. So again, like about 3.4% degradation compared to having text at the source language, but still way better than the other baseline models. Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, we've, in addition to testing our approach on synthetic data, we have also had a follow-up paper which tests our approach on real data. So the real data is a very uh, recently released one called like Vox Populi. So it's like, Euromant, like Euromant, a European Parliament uh, like interpretation for like what the main speaker is speaking and what the interpreter, interpreter interprets. So we see at the, on the top, this is the same setup as what we did before. So we still see like reasonable number like 16 or 15. So we see huge degradation. And then we also uh, introduce like many other techniques in that paper to further improve the performance with the real data setup. But again, like uh, I will skip the results uh, for now, just to make sure I can cover other things. Okay, so in the last part, uh, I'm going to talk about a rather experimental but interesting like uh, project we do, which is called like textless NLP. 
So our motivation is that uh, we know like GPT-1, 2, 3 are super imp impressive in terms of like generating new content or doing sentence completion or maybe like writing a paper for you after you give it the first sentence, right? So, uh, but like this has a problem of like we cannot use that for unwritten languages, right? Because we don't have a text system again. And this has a lot of like language like Swiss German, Arabic dialects, Chinese dialects. And moreover, even for the written languages, we still see that the spoken form and the written form are very different. So for the spoken form, you will include like some silence, some back channeling, or prosody to emphasize some concept you want to emphasize, and maybe speak very fast when you want to say something that doesn't want to be hear, heard. So anyway, yeah. So we argue that like text might not be the best representation for speech because it does not model a lot of things like spoken cues. So our goal here is to again leverage the discrete units we discover to build a language model on these discrete units and see if they can better model the speech in terms of like say doing unconditional speech generation or prompted generation just for fun. Yeah. So okay, so we introduced like two models uh, in this series of work. The first is like the generated spoken language model, which is a very basic one that just like replace the whatever characters or word piece with this like discrete units, and we train a causal language model on it. So once we train that, we can give it a prompt for like say two seconds or three seconds and do sampling after that, and then synthesize the generated like the sampled sequence back into waveform to listen to like what it says, right? Does it make sense or is it like grammatically correct? And we also have another model that is more tailor-made for speech, where we argue that we show earlier unit captures this like content, but not so much about like prosody. And also these units are encoded at the segment level. So we also want to predict its duration. So how fast it speaks and how slow it speaks would also change the distribution of the duration for segments within a sequence. Okay, so uh, here I'm going, we have a lot of quantitative results in the paper, but like here I'm just going to play some samples which is way more interesting than reading through those numbers. Okay, so the, I'm going to first show the first model. So the evaluation problem here is we are going to give the model uh, three seconds of the prompt. Uh, we're going to use uh, Hubert to infer the discrete units and feed into a language model, and as I say, like continue generation for say 10 seconds. So uh, let me first play the prompt we use here. Cried one of the women. He took no notice of her. He looked. Okay, so this is the original audio. All right, so we're going to compare like three different units just to demonstrate like having good feature for clustering is good and to establish how it's different from text-based representation. So the first one we do is a very nice baseline, which is filter bank units. So we extract filter bank, we quantize them into 100 clusters, which is the same as what we use for Hubert in this experiment. So now let's listen to how it sounds if we train a vocoder and train a language model on the quantized filter bank units. So this is what it sounds. <laughs> Yeah, so basically you see like cried one for the woman, it does not very precisely capture like the thing there, but it captures maybe like vowel versus non-vowel, silence versus non, so it's a blah, 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 blah. And then try to also train a language model that learns to maybe not speak for too long, like some like random phrases it emits. So this is what you get from like bad, qual bad quality cluster language model. And now we have, uh, or Hubert units, which again is unsupervised. So this is the, again, concatenating the resynthesized part followed by the generated part. Cried one of the women. He took no notice of her. He looked up and saw that it was a great pity. He saw the baby who was being called. Okay, so at least like to me, when I first listened to these samples, I was really impressed because like, it just like was turned on. So the language model was turned on like 60, uh, 6,000 hours of the a worth of units which we transcribe from speech. And then it actually learns to capture, it resynthesizes pretty well, which is what we have heard already, but it also learns to continue with the like the consistent like pronoun, like she cried one for the woman, he took notice of her, he blah blah blah. And also like the grammar, at least maybe I'm non-native speaker, so I didn't spot all the arrows. But to me it sounds like reasonable to some extent. Although the sentence probably does not make too much sense, 
if we generate longer, it might be making even less sense. But at least it is generating something grammatically correct and also preserve like pause and like have natural prosody in there. So finally, let's listen to the character-based model. So for character, it's very simple. We just like run, uh, we actually take the ground truth transcript as a prompt and then train the character language model to do generation. And then train a TTS model to convert character back to speech, the standard TTS model. So this is uh, what it sounds. Cried one of the women, he took no notice of her. He said the other had heard her say that she was a traitor and that he was a coward. Okay, so you also hear like it's producing something maybe grammatically reasonable, but again, like what I want to point out is like first it misses the pause of cried one of the women because like in a text transcription, you don't preserve that information, right? When you see that in, of course you can annotate that, but most of the time it's not really annotate that. So this is something like missing from text, yeah. Okay, so uh, this probably will be the last slide, so I'm finishing up very soon. So the next one is the prosody away generative language model where we have a multi-stream transformer basically. So at each step, it takes the duration of the segment, the average prosody, um, speaker normalized prosody of the segment, and also what the self-supervised unit is for that segment, and model everything like autoregressively. So uh, several questions we want to answer in this work is, uh, first, we want to ask if prosody is important at the input. So if we have prosody information, basically, does it improve content modeling. We can measure that by negative log likelihood of the content part, right? So I'm not going to show a number here, but the answer is, uh, is yes. And we're also going to see, uh, does it still work if we don't give prosody at the input but predicting a prosody? So this would be assuming that condition on the content, prosody are conditionally independent, like given, basically given the content, which we know for sure if in more expressive speech, it's not going to be the case because the speak the speed you speak sentences are going to be somewhat like correlated. If you start slower, you probably would also continue that slower. And if I speak very fast, I'm going to very, probably continue very fast. So this is also something we observe. Okay, and the second thing we want to compare is whether we want to use like quantized prosody versus like a continuous prosody. So like duration or pitch are naturally like continuous value. But we want to see whether it's better to be modeled as continuous value using like L1 or L2 loss versus if we want to learn to quantize them such that we predict a categorical distribution at each step. So it has the potential of being modeled as like not a just a unimodal distribution here and how it will impact the generation performance. So again, like uh, here, I'm going to condition the model on a more expressive prompt. So this is a prompt. Love is a babe. Then so, so you hear it's uh, speaking in the like a slower fashion and like more like emotional fashion like lazy like love is a babe well, Okay, so first we're going to see how a model would perform if we do not have prosody at the input and we predict prosody as continuous values So this is a simple Love is a babe Let me shall possibly be put to death because it is Abram's place, which possibly would not permit ways to come to and bring people to the Lord. So what you can hear is that uh, the first part is resynthesis. So you see like it still continue, it still like speaks in a slower tone. But after the prompt part, it resumes back to the average speed, right? So it means like it does not model the coherence between the speed of the prompt and the generated part. So we do see as human, like we do hear that like it's not supernatural this way. And also the pitch is like reverted to the average of the speaker. So what if we change the continuous one to the quantized one? Then this is the result. Love is a babe. Then my sire, and you under the leaves of the dawn of the dark, windeth in the dark galley of the lists and the pole. This record. Yeah, so it's again not natural. And the reason for that is we argue because we do not have prosody at the input. So it does not know in what distribution, conditional distribution, it should continue. So combining these observations, we propose our model which takes prosody at the input and also predict like discretized prosody. So this is our simple. Love is a babe. Then methinks that many tears should fly into my brain and be still that boulder of doves in all their conflict. 
Yeah, so you see like at least to me it sounds like it's continuous in a coherent fashion in terms of both the speed and the tone. The speed between the prompt and the condensation part is relatively like consistent. And finally we have a model that again has the prosody at the input but models like continuous prosody. Sire, and oh, you sorry, I played the wrong one. It was no end of starved. It was a babe. The world was waiting. Alas, I have no feet. Okay, so maybe I didn't play it very like correctly. But anyway, we have more samples at the link at the bottom. So what we observe is that if you predict that as continuous value, it still has somewhat uh, some extent of the correlation but the level of expressiveness tends to be lower than, you pre than predicting the discrete one because it turns to, like, again, like reverse to its mean like more frequently. So we see, say, if the average speed is like this, like off, off the average, then like, uh, the generated one would be sli slightly lower, but then still on the right side of like, whether it's slower or it's faster. Yeah. OK, so finally, to conclude this talk, so we present like just a simple and effective self-supervised learning framework and show that it's effective for a number of tasks. And we also showed that uh, this can be used as a speech codec uh, from the Hypergen exploration and also uh, serves as the target for generative modeling. And we can also build some like GPT-like model uh, that can generate speech, continuous speech in a coherent and in a reasonable way. And of course, like it's not nowhere as good as GPT in terms of like coherency in terms of the content. But again, we want to argue it's only like six thousand hours of the data compared to how much text GPT uses. It's just a fraction of that, right? So finally, we most of our models have uh, are available on Hugging Face or on FairSeek. So if anyone wants to use that, uh, please go ahead. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm also looking for like fall and summer like intern. So just want to do some advertisement here. And in the last page, I want to also mention some other ongoing work at Facebook I Research on self-supervised learning. So uh, in addition to the work I mentioned, we also have a lot of like parallel work on modeling, such as wave to vec like series like 1, 2, and also data to vec more recently, and some data augmented like CPC. Uh, we also model, try to model different modalities. So the multi-model version of the Huber is called audio-visual audio Huber which we show it's good for lip reading, for audiovisual speech recognition, especially in very noisy environments and speech recognition, uh, because like, it can derive even higher quality units than using the audio itself, because you have lip. And also we have some analysis paper on extending that to multilingual or study the domain shift and how it is complementary to self-training or other traditional semi-supervised learning techniques. And finally, we also explore a lot of applications like unsupervised ASR, zero-shot phone recognition, uh, speech to text or to speech translation, and also language ID. Yeah. So that will conclude my talk today. And again, thanks all, uh, thanks you all for your attention, and happy to take any questions.